Um, by Thursday, all right? Next week is spring break, you guys. Over and then once it's in there, they'll um, it mixes with water and makes hydrogen. Well, carbonic acid first. Yeah. And then hydrogen ions. So why not these hydrogen ions? Because they don't cross the blood brain barrier. Okay, remember our blood brain barrier that we talked about with in bio 430? Um, the tight, tight junctions, the increased number of junctions uh, between the simple squamous epithelia. So PCO2 is actually what um, our brain is indirectly is detecting, but um, the receptors are for hydrogen ions. And so as we'll see as we go through the lecture today, your level of PCO2 is the triggering factor, but that diffuses across the blood-brain barrier as a gas and is converted in the same chemical reaction we talked about on Tuesday. Friday with carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid. And thus, it's actually the hydrogen ions that, it, that the receptors in the medulla are sensitive to. So we're, we're switching. We've been spending our entire time talking about structures in the lung, structures within the thoracic cavity, and blood vessels. And now we're going to look at, OK, what determines breathing time, breathing rate, breathing rhythm, breathing depth. So one of our lab activities today, we're not going to be doing the breathing in CO2 because I added that after I told the lab tech what I wanted to do and they haven't made up the solution yet, but I want to put in there for at least next year. So we're going to do a more basic, no pun intended, a more streamlined um, activity. 
But one of the activities we are going to do involves breathing into and out of a bag so that you're rebreathing your own CO2. Okay. In rebreathing your own CO2, what would you expect that would do to your respiratory rate? Would you be able to hold your breath longer or for a less amount of time? A less amount of time. Okay. There was an incident about eight years ago. I was home watching the evening news and um, uh, about 20 police cadets um, were at a pool in Stockton, and about 11 of them had passed out underwater. What? And uh, I turned to my kids and I said, I know what they were doing. They, I forbidden they'd be able to hold their breath longer underwater. My daughter's like, well, what do you mean hyperventilating? Hyperventilating is deep, rapid breathing. Where you're breathing off CO2, that lowers the drive that you have to breathe, and you can hold your breath longer. Unfortunately, if you are underwater, you pass out from lack of oxygen, and you start to, you're triggered to take a breath as your CO2 levels begin to rise while you are unconscious, and your trigger to take a breath occurs while you're still underwater. So when you take that gas, you're pulling water into your lungs. Okay? Those two concepts of breathing into a paper bag and being able to hold your breath longer after you've hyperventilated are the keys to the entire lecture's concept today. So some of these slides are going to look confusing, and they are. Um, so I want you to just kind of engage with me, I'll write stuff up on the board, and then I'm going to go back periodically and underline or emphasize the stuff that I really want you to know. All right. Part of the confusing stuff is we keep getting new information, um, and so some of that I've introduced, but I will highlight and be exact on what it is I actually want you to know. All right, so control of respiration. When we look at our brain stem, we have the medulla and pons, and we have our fourth ventricle, and the central controller is primarily in the medulla. We have two groups of neurons, and these are elongated regions known as the dorsal respiratory group and ventral respiratory group. Together, this is known as the rhythmicity center. This is required for breathing. Remember we talked about myriencephalic babies that were born without a cerebral cortex, those of you that had me for bio 430, but if they had the brain stem intact, they were able to breathe for at least a certain period of time um, if their parents wanted to, at least long enough for them to donate organs after birth. We have additional centers in the pond. known as the new state, though it's now called the Pontine Center, so I'm going to put that, um, well, we have pneumotaxic. And apneustic centers in the ponds. And while these are not required to be able to breathe, you can separate, you can cut separate the ponds from the medulla and the individual will still be able to breathe. All right, it's not a even breathing component. And so these are involved in the central controller area. And then we have sensors. We have things that modulate when we breathe. Right? So we have Chemocenters. Um, these are found in the central nervous system and are found in the peripheral nervous system. So we have chemoreceptors. 
for hydrogen ions, for carbon dioxide, and for oxygen. All of these are, uh, well, the hydrogen ions and the PCO2 are sensitive for within the CNS. And we have sensors for all of these in the PNS. There's no sensor for oxygen in the central nervous system. By central nervous system, I'm referring to what I've drawn on the board, the pons and the medulla. In addition to chemoreceptors, we have mechanoreceptors. And these are for stretch, so how far the lung is expanding, okay? Uh, primarily for stretch in the lungs, the some lesser degree, degree pressures. So those are the sensors. And then we have effectors. So the control of our respiratory center is going to send information back to muscles. And these are our respiratory muscles. So our primary inspiratory muscles are external intercostals and the diaphragm. So breathing is in essence a reflex. Now in Bio 430, you learned about, we learned about reflexes, and we had visceral reflexes, and we had voluntary muscle, skeletal muscle reflexes. What was an example of a visceral reflex that we talked about with the autonomic nervous system? Clenching? Pardon? Clenching? No, that's skeletal muscle. Uh, bladder? All right, so bladder, the urinary bladder, had both skeletal and involuntary. Um, I was thinking of something earlier than that in the eyes. So when we shine a, pu a light flashlight in your eye and the pupil constricts, all right, that smooth muscle contraction in response to the light. Um, we have certainly reflexes we talked about with the, with the um, heart. So when uh, blood pressure drops, there's a response to change that component. So what about breathing? Are we talking about autonomic or skeletal muscle reflexes? Skeletal. Skeletal. Diaphragm and external intercostals are skeletal muscles. All right? So the fact that we can fall asleep and continue to breathe is indicative of the fact that this is a re reflex. We don't have to constantly think about the fact that we need to take a breath. All right? There is, however, uh, even involving skeletal muscles, there is a component here called a pattern generator. Can you think of voluntary activities that you do that involve pattern generators? No voluntary. Something that you do repetitively, that you don't have to think about doing, because you do it so often. Walk. Exactly. Walking is a pattern generator. All right? Um, experiments have, have uh, been done, unfortunately, with um, cats, um, where the separa there's a separation at the brain stem, but there's a pattern generation. They put them on a treadmill, and if the treadmill's moving under their feet, they keep walking. All right? So that there's not a cortical consciousness, I'm going to pick up one foot and put it in front of the other, but there's this pattern generator. And so we have a pattern generator that's been <clears throat> hypothesized, and some people think is proven to exist in the whole respiratory system as well. So I'm going to put that in right here. It's part of the ventral respiratory uh, neurons. And this is called the pre, really interesting term, pre botzinger complex. Okay, a respiratory pattern generator. 
All right, I think we've got the major players up here on the board. Well, let me put up the... We do have upper portions of the brain that are involved. Emotions affect our breathing. Speech patterns affect our breathing. That type of thing. I'll just put it there, but I'm not going to get into those factors. Okay. So here's what kind of what I drew on the board. We have the ventral respiratory group, the dorsal respiratory group, and the pontine respiratory centers, the pneumothoracic and acoustic centers. So essentially what happens in brief is we have the pattern generator the pre botsing of the complex that sets up the pattern activating our dorsal respiratory group. The dorsal respiratory group are primarily, just kind of listen here, we'll go, go back over this in detail, are primarily inspiration neurons. So they're going to trigger inhalation. So when these fire, they're going to send a signal to the intercostal and to the diaphragm. How do you think that happens? Vagus nerve? Well, no. These are intercostals. What's the nerve that innervates the intercostal? The intercostal nerves. And the nerve that innervates the phrenic nerve? The phrenic nerve. Or rather the diaphragm, thank you. Yeah. The phrenic nerve. So what happens is these actually send neurons down to the cervical spinal cord and to the thoracic spinal cord, and then our lower motor neurons head out to the external intercostals and to the diaphragm. Okay. So unlike what it looks like here, there is no direct neuron from the medulla that goes to the intercostals and the diaphragm. It's really going down to the cervical and thoracic spinal cord for those lower motor neurons. All right, so components of neural control of respiration. So we have the generation of the respiratory rhythm, our pre-boxing of complex, our respiratory pattern generator. That's going to activate our dorsal respiratory group for inhalation. <coughs> we can't just keep taking in a breath, right? If we did that, we would pop our alveoli and rupture our visceral pleura. So there has to be a drop off in that, and we'll see kind of a, an increasing uh, ramping effect, and then it drops off. And then, so part of that regulation of depth of breathing comes from our ventral respiratory group. Um, though this is more involved, the ventral respiratory group is more involved in forced breathing activities, either forced inspiration or forced exhalation. And then the primary regulation of the rate and depth comes from our pods. Modification of respiratory movements also has to do with the pods and then you know, things like coughing and, and talking and so on. So the generation of the respiratory rhythm, this is looking at the dorsal view of the pons and medulla with the cerebellum gone. So you're seeing the diamond portion of the fourth ventricle. All right, and we're looking at the ventral respiratory group with the pre or complex that I drew on the board and seeing that here as well. Oh, the red one. So this is like, remember how we talked about the autorhythmic sounds for the heart? The sinoatrial nodes and the fact that it depolarized on its own? <clears throat> Similar to that is the theory behind the neurons of the pre or complex. So our sinoatrial node were modified muscle cells. All right, the pre-boxing or complex is actually neurons, but it's thought to fire on its own in a predetermined pattern that we then modify by changing levels primarily of CO2 <coughs> that become converted to carbon dioxide. And that essentially is what I want you to know about the pre-boxing or complex. Okay. It's a pattern generator. 
have the actual regulation, the determination of the respiratory pattern of breathing. So back here's the pneumotaxic and apneusic center, ventral respiratory group, dorsal respiratory group. So there's a circuitry that is occurring here where the dorsal respiratory group activates the ventral respiratory group, which activates the dorsal respiratory group. The apneustic center is going to activate the dorsal respiratory group and be inhibited by the pneumotaxic center. I'm not going to ask you to repeat this diagram, okay? So I'm just showing you that there is a circuitry here similar to our basal nuclei, but not as complicated. So let me go kind of through what's going on here, why one is excitatory and why one is, well not excitatory, but inspiratory and the other is um, exhalation. And so then we have a, the modification. So let's go back and look at the regulation of rate and depth again. So sequence of events here. pre your complex generates this rhythm of spontaneously discharging neurons, hence the uh, illusion alluding to the similarities with the SA node. Then we have respiratory neurons in the medullary respiratory center, the dorsal respiratory group firing for inspiration. If we want to modify that more, do deeper inspirations or forceful expirations, we use the ventral respiratory group. And the neurons in the pons regulate the rate and depth. So whether we have a longer and deeper inhalation, all right? or whether we stop breathing at all. Essentially, this page is the information I want you to know. Okay, so we'll come back to it. I'll, let, I'll leave it up there for a little bit longer. But this is kind of a summary of all the rest of the information that I want you to know as far as what these different groups do. We're going to talk about the role of CO2 and, and hydrogen ions and so on in addition. But as far as the role of the structures that I have diagrammed on the board, this is a summary of that. So we start, we have our respiratory pattern generator occurring. We start uh, ventilation as the dorsal respiratory group fires. It's going to activate our phrenic nerve to the diaphragm, right? And it's going to activate intercostal nerve. So that's what we have here. So we're going to have dorsal respiratory groups going to lower motor neurons, intercostal nerves, to the external intercostal muscles, and phrenic nerve to the diaphragm causing an increase in the anterior posterior diameter and an increase in the superior inferior diameter with the diaphragm. And that lowers thoracic cavity pressure and atmospheric pressure pushes air into the lungs. So this continues for about two seconds. All right? I don't know if you recall when we were starting our respiratory lab activity <coughs> last week that I said we breathe in for about two seconds and breathe out for about three. So we see this continuing ramping effect. If you look at the neuronal action potentials that are produced, we see something that it looks like this. So the dorsal respiratory neurons fire increasingly more, and then they stop. There's a period, about approximately three seconds, where we have passive expiration, and then we see this ramp effect again. And then there's a period of about three seconds where passive expiration allows all of the, the diaphragm to move up and the ribs to come down. So this is two seconds of inspiration and approximately three seconds <coughs> of expiration. Okay. And this is activity of the dorsal respiratory group instigated by the pattern generation of the pre-Watzinger complex. 
So we stop we stop inspiration. The dorsal respiratory group stops firing. That's probably because of stretch receptors that are activated that affect the pontine respiratory center. But you could overcome that voluntarily, right? You can take a deep breath. And you're certainly firing those stretch receptors, but there's a voluntary override that can occur. So here's a diagram similar to what I put up on the board. Our pneumotaxic and apneustic centers, our dorsal respiratory group, and ventral respiratory group. And Inspiratory neurons. I want you to know that the dorsal respiratory group is made up of inspiratory neurons. If I can write that guy. I wrote it here, I'll just underline it. So they fire more and more and more. You breathe deeper and deeper and deeper and then they stop firing and you expire air. Okay. This can be modified by the chemicals we're going to look at. Levels of CO2 and hydrogen ions in the central nervous system, levels of oxygen as well in the peripheral nervous system. So that's what's indicated here. So we have the dorsal respiratory group sending information down to the lower re um, motor neurons, to external intercostal and to the diaphragm, you breathe in, that stops, and expiration, remember, is typically passive. So the diaphragm relaxes, rises up, the ribs relax and come down, and you breathe out. Okay? Now, obviously, while I'm talking, I'm modifying all of that. And so, it took scientists a while to figure out which of these neurons were doing what, because if you look at the medulla, you're going to have hypoglossal nerve firing during breathing, you're going to have a glossopharyngeal nerve firing during breathing. You're going to have a vagus nerve firing during breathing. And all of that is because of modifications of speech and so on that occur. But they're not the primary neurons involved in moving our diaphragm. So this is an illustration of the ramp effect. All right, similar to what I drew on the board. So firing for two seconds, you breathe in. Stops firing, you breathe out. Pass it. Fire for two seconds, you breathe in. Why does it have to be a ramp effect? Why can't it just fire the same amount? Why do the number of action potentials increase? To cross over the threshold? Well, when you breathe in, you don't just go, you're including more and more and more muscle fibers because you're continuing to flatten out the diaphragm and you're continuing to do more force as you lift the ribs. So it takes a greater amount of uh, neural activity to include more and more muscles. So this is a standard pattern that even with new information you'll still find um, in the textbooks as modification um, occurs. So this is just the dorsal respiratory group. This is for normal Quiet breathing, you're not trying to blow out birthday candles um, or blow up a balloon or whatever. All right, so dorsal respiratory group active. This is where you would put in the pre botzinger complex with its pattern generator, okay? Triggering the pattern that the dorsal respiratory group fires. So this would be kind of coming in from the side would be our pre botzinger complex driving this activity. Inspiratory muscles contract during the rep effect. Dorsal respiratory group stops, passive expiration. Okay, so this, you, I think you have this diagram in your um, textbook. So that's their role, triggered by the pre or complex. And then we have the, um, come back to this in a moment, then we have the ventral respiratory group. That's still in the medulla, okay, part of the medullary respiratory system. And notice this has both inspiratory neurons and expiratory neurons. Okay. This one is directly influenced by the stretch receptors. So our dorsal respiratory group is going to be primarily influenced by the 
chemoreceptors. Because remember, that's what triggers our breathing. And the ventral respiratory group by the mechanical.